All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. I am Rashida Young, partner for the Schools, Talent, and Racial Equity team here at Education Forward DC. And I am joined by Caitlin Campbell Hahn and Matt Nochella, also of the Ed Forward DC team. Education Forward DC is a local grant making organization that envisions a DC where students starting furthest from opportunity can chart their own path and thrive. Supporting school based mental health is a focus um, of Ed Forward DC's school quality strategy. And today we're going to be highlighting lessons from two complementary recent investment that Ed Forward DC has made in school-based mental health. One, to elevate and learn from citywide trends around student well-being, and the other, to support schools in testing out interventions to support wellness in their specific communities. First, we'll be hearing from Melissa Steele King of Bellwether on their second year of analysis of student well-being in DC using panorama survey data. And then we'll hear from some school leaders who were recipients of an Ed Forward DC grant to support piloting of a school-based uh, of a school-based mental health initiative in partnership with Transcend. These pilots will include a whole child lunch block, uh, which was piloted by HD Cook Elementary School, providing mental health supports for staff, which was piloted by Thurgood Marshall Academy. Implementing Strong Start in Spanish, which was piloted by Bunker Hill Elementary School, and engaging in adult crew experiences, which was piloted by Two Rivers. This morning, we published the learnings from these pilots in a white paper that you can find on our website. We encourage you to read it and share it with your networks. Finally, we'll hear from Elizabeth Ross from our Office of the State Superintendent of Education, about their upcoming plans to support school-based mental health in DC. And we'll close out by hearing from Nico Dijan, a student at Phelps Ace High School, who will be sharing some thoughts on mental health from his perspective. We will have time for Q&A at the end, so we encourage you to share questions in the chat and to use the raise your hand feature. Um, actually, I think we're just gonna have the questions in the Q&A um, portion to be recognized um, so that we can answer, uh, receive and answer your questions. So I'd now like to introduce Melissa Still King of Bellwether, a partner and evaluation leader in the policy and evaluation practice area at Bellwether. Thanks Rashida. Um, and I'm happy to be here today. Good to, to have everybody here. So as Rashida said, I'm a partner at Bellwether. Bellwether is a national nonprofit with a mission to transform education, to improve educational life outcomes for systemically marginalized young people. And our evaluation team conducted the survey analysis for this report. So I'm going to not go through the whole report today. I do hope you will um, download and read it because it has a lot more detail, but I will share some of the top line findings um, and takeaways from the report to just help inform our conversation today. Um, as Rashida said, this is the second year that we have done this analysis. So last year, 2023, we did a similar report with a much smaller sample of students. We are really pleased to have um, really tens of thousands of students joining this um, and schools joining, not tens of thousands of schools, tens of thousands of students and many more schools joining this year. So we have a much bigger sample to report on. Um, so I will dive in first to just give a little bit of background um, about the survey and our approach and then go into the findings. So first of all, the survey represents um, responses of over 30,000 students in public schools in DC. As you can see in this table, we were able to break the data out by gender, by race and ethnicity, and also by looking at students identified as at risk, students with disabilities, and English learners. Um, so we are able to present some of the findings from some of those different groups as well as the overall findings. And I also want to note that um, students were categorized as, categorized as Hispanic, 
through an ethnicity variable that was separate from race. So just something to note that if a student, for example, identifies as both Black and Hispanic, they will be represented in both of those um, categories. So uh, going on to the next slide. Um, these data represent a subset of the larger DC public school population, which is over 97,000 students. If you look in this table, um, you can see by comparing the first column, which is all DC students, with the second column, which is the survey sample. Uh, the survey sample is quite representative of the racial and ethnic demographics of the DC population. Very similar with a slight over representation of white and Native American students in the sample, but otherwise quite similar. Uh, and then on the next slide, you'll see that the analysis combines data from multiple groups of students who took slightly different versions of the survey. So just to take a minute to orient here, um, sample A and sample B in this table are really the bulk of the sample. The reason that there are different groups is that this, the version of the survey that students took differs a little depending on their age group and depending on what topics their school chose to offer from the panorama survey. So sample A and sample B is really the bulk. Um, you'll see that sample A is elementary school, grades three through five. Sample B took a very similar version, just with slightly different worded questions for older students, grades six through 12. And then sample C, D, and E took also took um, panorama survey questions, but they had slightly different topics. Nonetheless, all of them were aligned to the same themes as the bigger sample. So when we're reporting the data, you'll see that we specify which of the samples it came from. And then finally, in the next slide, when you put all the survey topics together, you'll see that they all align to three big themes that have to do with student well-being. Um, so I don't know what happened with the coloring there, but hopefully you can read it, that the overall themes on the left are school environment and supports. So um, topics that have to do with the external environment that um, affects students' well-being. The second category is self-perception and skills. And those are things like self-efficacy and perseverance, the sort of internal factors that relate to students' well-being. And finally, the last theme is quality relationships, having to do with the networks that support students. So across all those slightly different versions of the survey, they all line up into these three big buckets um, and that we'll be talking about today. Last little piece of business of understanding how we approached the analysis is how we calculated the scores. So um, for each survey topic, there were several questions within each topic um, or scale. And so to calculate the scale score, we calculated the average across all the questions. So for example, in this on the screen, you see the perseverance questions in teal. There were four separate questions that made up that scale. And then in gold, you'll see that the average for those questions was 56%. And that's the score that we're reporting is the average score for that um, perseverance scale. So that is a little bit of uh, background about the sample and the approach. And I'll spend a couple minutes on this overall slide just to orient us to some of the very high level findings. This is a roll up of the scores across each of the three themes and the scales within those themes. So first I just wanna say on this slide, um, that you can see some bright spots. For example, in school environment and supports, under rigorous expectations, you see that uh, a strong majority of students of both grade, grade bands, three through five and six through 12, 
reported that their teachers hold them to rigorous expectations. Similarly, all the way on the right under quality, ex uh, quality relationships, you can see that a very strong majority reported that they have supportive relationships in their lives. That could be family members, teachers, other adults, um, friends. Um, so students are well, have a lot of students have supportive networks, which is great. And really overall, as you sort of look across the percentages on all of these scales, you can see that for most things, more than half of students had favorable responses. So that is a, a good um, basic starting place. That said, another thing that you can see here on this slide, if you look with the gold headings are the scales, and under e most of them, you'll see that there is a number for grades three through five and a number for grades six through 12. On many of them, you'll see that the older students are responding less favorably on these multiple measures of well being than the younger students. So, for example, in the upper left, under the sense of belonging, you'll see that 70% of students. In grades three through five, responded favorably about feeling a sense of belonging compared to just 48% for grades six through 12. So we're gonna talk a little bit in a little bit more depth about those age differences that are you can see here on this page. Um, flipping to the next slide, in addition, so that first takeaway is the point about the overall bright spots that we see with some strong majorities reporting high scores on some of these domains. And the second point is about the older students um, responding less favorably on various measures. Third, we wanted to call out um, some of the, we saw a few gender differences in students' self-perceptions. For example, that female students responded less favorably than male peers on the self-efficacy scale at older ages. And we'll also talk a little bit about some racial differences where we saw particularly Native American, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander students, as well as English learners and Hispanic students responding less favorably compared to peers on certain items related to self-efficacy and rigorous expectations. And there are some differences by age in there. So we're going to get into a little bit more detail, but again, for much more on each of these and, and additional findings, um, you can find that in the full report. Let's go to talk a little bit about this uh, trend of age differences with older students responding less favorably on some measures. So first, we can start with the sense of belonging scale, which I mentioned a minute ago where you have the difference of 70% in the elementary school um, years and 48% in six through 12. I wanted to note that we saw something very similar in the smaller sample last year. I do wanna emphasize that because it's not the same sample, we don't really wanna make conclusions or draw comparisons to say, oh, something changed or didn't change. Um, they are very different samples, so you can't exactly draw those lines, but it is interesting to see if you're seeing similar patterns repeated in this um, bigger sample. And for this one, we saw something very similar. Um, but then if you dig even deeper on the next slide into um, the different grade levels, um, you can see that those gold bars, grades 8, 9, and 10, are where you're really seeing the lowest scores for sense of belonging. So we're seeing something particularly happen here in late middle and early high school. And when you go to uh, the rigorous expectation scale um, on the next slide, you will also see a similar pattern where grades nine and 10 reported the lowest scores. So if you switch to the following slide, we will see that the ninth and 10th grade, even though all of the grade levels, as I mentioned, rigorous expectations was one of the highest rated categories. So all the grades, you had at least two thirds saying, yes, my teachers hold me to high expectations. But again, 
that's just the pattern of that dip um, around the transition to high school um, is evident here. And, um, and then again, going on to the valuing school scale on the next slide, we see something very similar where you have, again, a dip in the eighth, ninth, and 10th grade scores. Um, if you advance to the next slide, it, it will show the valuing, valuing, how much do students value school? Um, it's obviously much lower in high school, middle and high school in general, but with the lowest in the transition years. So that is a little snapshot of the um, age differences. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the gender differences that we saw in students' perceptions of the school environment and in themselves. Um, so first, starting with um, uh, the sense of belonging still, going back to that one on the next slide, we see on the left, is the um, grades three through five results, 70% for both male and female students in grades three through five. But when you look at the six through 12 results on the right, you can see that while 51% um, of students who identified as male in grades six through 12 said they felt a strong sense of belonging, that compares to 45% for students identifying as female and just a quarter of students identifying as non-binary said they feel a strong sense of belonging in that age group. Um, I want to note on this slide and the previous one that uh, the reason there is no bar for non-binary in the grades three through five is that no students in that group in our sample identified as non-binary. Um, so we don't have that comparison, but this is uh, the same trend, right? On this slide, you see um, the self-efficacy scale. Uh, again, there's very similar, really no difference between genders in the uh, grades three through five group. In six through 12, you see a gap, particularly between male students and female students um, on feeling a sense of self-efficacy. And finally, on the next slide, we see a similar trend on the perseverance scale, where uh, when asked to what extent they feel like they can persevere through difficult tasks. Um, we had very similar responses in elementary school, but in the six through 12 uh, group, um, female students and students who are non-binary are answering are reporting lower scores than male students where two thirds of male students said that they feel favorable about this. Um, and next, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the, the racial ethnic differences that, that popped out. Um, first, I'll just note uh, that um, on the sense of belonging scale, well, really on, quite a few scales, there was actually a lot of similarity across race ethnicity. So on the next slide is an example with the sense of belonging scale where there really was not necessarily a meaningful difference by race or ethnicity, which is positive that, um, you know, most students of different races and ethnicities felt uh, a similar sense of belonging in the school. And that's on the next slide. Um, we have these tables where on the left is the um, grades two through five broken out by race and ethnicity on the right is grades six through 12. And if you look at the last column, that is the difference in percentage points for each group from the overall average. So how much did they differ from the overall average across groups? And you can see on this scale, no group is more than one or two points or zero points from the average. So that's um, a positive finding. 
uh, over on the next slide, which is reporting the rigorous expectations scale, um, you can see that in elementary school, Native American students score was eight percentage points below the overall average on this. So again, how much do you feel that teachers hold you to high expectations? This is sort of coming out as lower. We, if it was, we really looked, um, the ones that stood out were ones that were six or more point percentage points above average. I mean, away from the average. So that's one difference for elementary school students. On the next slide, you have the a somewhat similar finding for feelings of self-efficacy. So to what extent students feel confident that they can accomplish the work that's given to them. Um, again, Native American students in, uh, in the younger years, as well as Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, students who identified in those categories are um, a little bit farther lower than the average in terms of feelings of self-efficacy. And in grades six through 12, you again, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander students are, um, their score was 11 percentage points below the overall average. So that's something to note there. I will call out that these are um, pretty small samples of students. So, um, you know, it is, a, that's just something to take, keep in mind as you're interpreting the results. It's a very small sample. Um, and uh, I think that is, yeah, finally, I think we'll go to the next set of findings um, that we saw. I just want to note a finding similar to what we saw in last year's survey about relationships, that students report having strong relationships overall, but it's not necessarily with teachers. Um, so on the next slide, you can see that across grade levels, students reported a high score on supportive relationships. So a strong majority really feel that they have supportive relationships in their, in their life, whether that's with family, adults, friends, et cetera. And that was similar to what we found in the 2023 sample. This was also a very strong score. Um, but on the next slide, there was a group of a pretty small subset of the sample took the teacher student relationships scale from the panorama survey. So this specifically asks not just generally about adults in your life, but specifically about teachers. And while this is, uh, you know, two thirds did respond that they uh, feel that they have positive relationships with teachers, which is good. It is different from the percentage reporting that they have supportive relationships overall. So whereas that was 80 something percent, this is more in about 62% who are saying they have strong relationships with teachers. So there's some gap there. So not all of the relationships that they're talking about in their works are with teachers. We included a snapshot here on the right of the specific questions within this scale, ranging from a lot, you know, almost two thirds saying, when your teachers ask you how you're doing, how many of them are really interested in your answer? Um, uh, almost two thirds responding, they think their teachers are interested. Uh, down to the bottom item there, if you walked into class upset, how many of your teachers would be concerned? That's getting down closer to just um, more like half the students. So there's some range in sort of how teachers are respond, um, students are responding about how they think their their relationships with their teachers are. Um, so those are some of the some key findings to think about and that point to possible areas to explore more. So I'll just close out with a few thoughts on um, implications for the future. So on the next slide, we have a few recommendations for where to dig in. Again, we um, just wanna sort of provide this information for educators to use, but some of the suggestions we had, first of all, we just 
thought it was important to note that to the extent possible, um, it's really helpful for LEAs across the city to align around common survey items. So the more that that schools ask students the same questions around key categories, the more powerful this analysis is because we can put them together and, and really track trends over time. Um, and then second, we saw older students, as I mentioned, responding less favor favorably on domains like valuing school, sense of belonging, and it suggests that educators might want to investigate what would increase middle and high schoolers' perceptions that school is an engaging, relevant, and welcoming place. So there is something to dig into there. Um, relatedly, the findings generally point to a need to investigate additional ways to support students' well-being during that transition between middle and high school. Because we saw some of that, those dips in some of the well-being scores on eighth, ninth, and 10th grades. So um, thinking about smoothing that transition or understanding what's happening, we've even wondered, was this particular cohort in some ways affected developmentally in by where they were developmentally during the pandemic years? These are things that you would need more research to understand the source of. On the next slide, we have a few more recommendations for example, on the supportive relationship scale specifically, uh, the differences that we saw might point to a need to explore what students of different ages and demographics want and need from their relationships with adults at school. And you'll see more behind that recommendation in the report itself, because there are a few differences uh, by demographics and age on that scale. And then the last two points here, we're just noting that we saw gender and some racial differences, especially among older students around feelings of self-efficacy and perseverance. So some of those that you might think of as like internal factors that affect well-being. So that suggests just a need to understand what's driving those lower scores, what's going on with um, students who are female, non-binary, and some of the different racial groups um, that reported lower scores in the older years, and how can targeted supports be provided for those needs. Um, so that is the uh, end of my overview. I am excited to turn it over to the educators who've been trying different mental health strategies in schools and hear more about that. Um, we definitely, again, encourage you to read the full report. And um, I'm just excited to see how folks can, can use this to further improve supports for students' well-being in, across the city. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melissa. We so appreciate you being here. Um, and it's just really exciting to see a second year of the Student Speak Report. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I am really excited, like Melissa mentioned, to kind of turn it over to um, a discussion of how schools are actually using Panorama data to inform their student uh, school-based mental health programs. Um, and so to kick us off, um, I'm going to turn it over in a moment to Jennifer Tompkins, who is the principal of Bunker Hill Elementary School. Um, Jennifer and Bunker Hill is one of the schools that um, participated in the pilot that uh, Ed Forward funded. Um, we had four schools that um, piloted a school-based mental health intervention in their buildings and with support from Transcend, uh, participated in a community of practice to support their pilot work. Um, and so Jennifer is just going to take a few minutes to um, share a little bit about how Panorama data actually informed their pilot idea and, and talk more about um, what they tested out and, and what results they saw. So Jennifer, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, all. And again, thank you so much for the time, space, and the support um, to share a little bit about our pilot with Bunker Hill. Um, so I just want to kick it off by just sharing a little bit about Bunker Hill Elementary School. Um, it's located in the Brooklyn area, um, of course, of Washington, D.C. And we are a diverse community of 204 students. Um, as prefaced before, in reference to the Panorama uh, survey, it really provides school leaders uh, great insight 
um, to how connected scholars do feel to the school community. So back in fall of 2022, our scholars engaged in the Panorama Survey. And even though we did see an increase um, of students feeling love challenged and prepared from about 48% to 67%, we did notice that our English uh, language learners, which I will refer to as our L population, um, only 40% of our population felt um, a level of preparedness and connectedness, where um, 72 percent of our other population of students did feel that. So at that point in time, we decided to look a little bit deeper in the data and determine where was a place that we could find for our L population to feel connected um, and prepared um, to our community. Um, so we looked to determine pretty much an entry point for those scholars. Next slide, please. So we as a school um, had already started a strong partnership with Transcend um, around the whole child model. And we had already implemented um, Strong Start in our classrooms. So every day our scholars move through a Strong Start, which is represented on the screen here, of a greeting, a portion of a community build, um, a purposeful partnering section, a breathe and focus, and a goal setting. So every morning, pre-K to five students engage in this strong start every day. So we wanted to think about um, where could we create a platform for our English language learners to feel connected, to feel prepared, and to feel loved? And how could we pretty much go deeper in a model that we already were implemented at Bunker Hill? So here we were with Strong Start. And our thought was is that we could have our L population start off by leading in front of their peers specific components of Strong Start. And we started off with our Spanish teacher being the leader of this work. Um, it kind of was just a, gr a great marrying of the two together because we knew that um, our scholars were fluent in their native language. So that meant that, of course, each of these components could be just um, provided and supported and almost presented on a daily basis and making the students just feel super comfortable and super prepared. So we started off with the greetings for one week. We moved on to community building for another week, purposeful partnering, breathing and focus and goal setting. And our L population in our third grade classroom did this over time to where they were implementing each component of the strong start to their peers. And then what we were able to do was move this into either a broader setting to our school town halls, which increased this level of preparedness and connectedness because our L population was able to get in front of the whole school and showcase each of these components of the strong start. Next slide, please. So here is just um, some visuals of our Strong Start leaders. One, um, you've been chosen to lead right here, right in their classroom, doing it right for their peers every day. And then the next picture that you see here is them leading up the Strong Start in Spanish for our whole school community during our town halls. And then the next slide, please. So of course, with our pilot, we wanted to ensure that the families of our L population and our students were involved as well. So we brought them in, we had a session, we had a breakfast, and we wanted to kind of talk to them about what impact did you see from your scholars at home from them being part of this pilot. And here's just a little bit of the feedback that we received from families that their scholars felt more included at school. Um, he or she was not embarrassed um, to form friendships with students that did not speak their native language. And then um, they also noticed that their scholars felt a lot more secure and like motivated knowing that they were contributing something daily to the school community. Um, and it really motivated them to just be able to not only um, embrace the strong start, but just take those challenges and those um abilities to just kind of move forward and ask questions and feel comfortable not knowing in their space. Um, our families are, are you know, 100% our partners, and we wanted to ensure that they um, felt a level of pride for their students and the same level of pride that our students felt just being able to be part of this pilot. Um, it was truly important for us that every student um, felt a level of connectedness and was just able to just feel that level of love and feeling challenged and prepared um, at the end of the day. Thank you.
Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, we're going to ask you to stay on and join us for um, our panel. Um, and so I'm very pleased now to transition it over to a few more school leaders and also um, someone from Transcend who's going to be able to speak more about the pilot experience. Um, so we're really excited to be joined today by Raymond Whedon of TMA, Thurgood Marshall Academy, Keely Fitzgerald of H.G. Cook Elementary School, Alicia Neptune of Transcend, um, and also uh, Jennifer from Bunker Hill. Also, I'll give those folks a minute to turn their camera on so that everyone can see them. Um, and just a reminder, we will have time after this short panel for Q&A at the end. So please, um, if you have any questions of any of the wonderful folks on this panel or of Melissa for her presentation um, on the Student Speak report, please use the Q&A button at the bottom um, to drop your questions in there. And um, my colleague Rashida will um, facilitate a little Q&A once we wrap up with this panel. Uh, wonderful. And so first off, I would love to invite the four of you all, first of all, just to briefly share your name, your role, and the organization or school that you're representing. Um, and then also, I would love to hear what are your reflections or reactions or what was surprising to you from the presentation that you heard Melissa share previously about that snapshot of student well-being data in D.C.? Um, so we'll maybe go in the order of folks that I see on my screen. So Alicia, we'll start with you, and then Keely, Raymond, Jennifer, um, but would love for you to just um, introduce yourself and, and tell us what, what's coming up for you after that presentation. Alicia. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alicia Neptune. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work at Transcend, which is a nonprofit that supports communities in going on design journeys. Um, I uh, got the pleasure to work with uh, the Ed Forward team and schools across DC uh, on the school-based mental health pilots that we did, um, I guess, over the fall. Um, what else am I saying, Keelan? Oh, a re response to the, yeah, okay. Uh, I noticed, and I, I think I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I think um, I've heard from, from schools across the country that middle school um, and high school has changed post pandemic um, and that they're seeing uh, young people have experience, young people having experiences that they haven't had in the past um, and are thinking about ways to support them in ways that they didn't need to in the past um, or that weren't as, um, as prevalent in the past. And so I wasn't surprised to see that show up in the data today. I will pass it to Keely. Hello, my name is Keely Fitzgerald. Um, I'm the Assistant Principal of Literacy here at H.D. Cook Elementary School. And something that kind of stood out to me about the data, um, I've solely been in elementary school settings. So seeing the drop um, in the data when it came for like that sense of belonging between elementary school and middle school, um, I know that's something that I've kind of thought about, even think about like our fifth graders and that transition to middle school. So maybe just think a little bit more about like what we could maybe do on our end, on the elementary end, to make sure that like, you know, we're kind of like bridging that transition from elementary school to middle school for our students. So um, to kind of support with some of that work. Thanks, Keely. Raymond? So good afternoon, everyone. Raymond Whedon at Thurgood Marshall Academy. Um, so I think similarly, like especially experiencing the ninth grade transition, we have 38 different middle schools that we receive students from. Uh, from across the city and just recognize just the importance of that ninth and 10th grade transition. And and the good news is that the the numbers go up when they get into the 11th and 12th grade, which I it shows about um, this longevity in the school, building relationships that are lasting in the school and the importance of that. And so those are two things that I kind of notice. And I run a high school in Ward 8, um, 9th or 12th grade. And finally, Jennifer, would love to invite you to, obviously you've already introduced yourself, but um, share any reactions to the, the Bellwether report. Thank you. Um, yes, Jennifer Tompkins, Bunker Hill. Similarly to uh, my colleagues, I think there's this sense of like an intentionality around creating the platforms for students. Um, as we shared from that report, that shift from like elementary 
elementary to middle school where we really um, may think and believe that students pretty much have the tools to find like where they fit and where they belong. I think it's important for us as leaders in schools to create those intentional platforms so that, te that, so that students do feel that level of connectedness, but it's almost something that's created for them um, to be able to kind of build their self within. So I think just the intentionality is something that I took away from the report that needs to um, occur as we are bridging our students from um, elementary to middle, for sure. Great, thank you all. Um, first question, Raymond, would love to turn to you. Um, you and I have spoken about how there's this huge sense of urgency among school leaders in DC, but I think it's also fair to say across the country around school-based mental health. Um, and I think sometimes the tendency is for school leaders to really feel like they need to tackle all of the problems that they're seeing, all of the challenges that they're seeing at once. Um, and I would just love to hear your perspective on um, how you thought it was helpful or why it was helpful for TMA to be participating in a pilot in this way. Thank you. Uh, so the pilot for us was the opportunity for us to test out a hypothesis. And so we noticed a lot. We were, I don't think anything that we experienced during the pandemic was really new. It just amplified what was happening uh, and it really amplified for us in terms of what was happening in our adult teams lives. And so to be able to try out a pilot, which is actually a, one is safe, one is funded. Both of those things are helpful. Um, but then two, to have like some trusted professionals to really help work through it, to me seemed like a no brainer in order to really figure out like, will this work? And if it will work, um, what can we do about it? And then our team was more so, um, probably more gun ho about it than I was, which makes it a lot easier in terms of like, yes, this is the right thing for us to kind of stress test, mainly because they were getting the informal request for support and help from our adult team, our mental health team, uh, which we really don't have the capacity to do. So for us, it was a way for us to test out a hypothesis, um, for that hypothesis to come true, which is really important for us and, and worked out well. And then next year, our plan is to actually expand the pilot in like a thinking big but acting small kind of way um, versus putting all of our eggs in, in that one basket and doesn't work out and then it's like a flop. So it's actually an opportunity for us to have kind of calculated success um, in, in this kind of area. Thanks, Raymond. I think that ties in really well to, to Keely, what I'd love to talk to you about, because um, as you know, Transcend led a community of practice of the schools that were participating in the pilot to sort of walk all of the teams through the pilot process and the various steps involved. Um, obviously, the HD Cook team was tackling this idea of a whole child lunch. Um, and I would just love for you to talk about like, what were your aha moments or your big takeaways from participating in that community of practice? And how is that shaping what you're thinking about in terms of broader implementation um, of that work next year? Great. So I think like our biggest takeaway, um, and it kind of came when we had that one session where we were kind of pushed to think about um, our pilot as a pizza and think about what our whole is. And then thinking about like the different toppings um, that would kind of help uh, make up that whole. So for us, when we initially started thinking about our pilot, we've had so much success with the whole child model um, and other portions of our day. And we really were thinking about lunch, which is a period of time where we will kind of see some increased behavior referrals and how we could pull some of those different strategies from our model into that lunch time. Um, but initially, you know, we were thinking very big, right? We we're like, we want a whole child lunch. And, uh, but um, kind of as we've progressed through it, we started to like really kind of like zoom out and think about what is it that we really want, right? And it's like, we want a community that feels safe, they feel loved, they feel connected. And then post that, we kind of thought about, you know, we think about our students, which is like our whole child lunch portion. We start thinking about like our teachers and then we start thinking about our family and community. And then we really kind of zoomed in with our whole child lunch since that was like our initial kind of focus. We started breaking down those different components. So thinking about like having a greeting, that choice seating so they had that autonomy, um, creating a safe space like we have in the classroom. And kind of once we did that, we were like, man, we were just like, you know, kind of getting really caught up in the weeds of when we thinking about this whole child lunch. But it's like we could have really just started with let's start greeting children at the door. So doing it like one ingredient, like one topping at a time that kind of really connects back to like our whole vision or, or picture about kind of the kind of space that we want 
for our school. And as we think about like rolling out in the future, um, I think, you know, our whole child lunch is a great start, but we already kind of like dived into like, we want, um, you know, this experience also to be for our staff. So we've already kind of started refreshing like our staff lounges. We're thinking about adult centering and other ways um, we could kind of build that in for our teachers. And then we also want to explore that for like our families too. But we have these three big buckets now. Um, so now we just have the opportunity to kind of think about what are those toppings that will help, um, you know, kind of go under those buckets that will help us like achieve those goals moving forward. Great. Thank you. I love that you brought up the pizza analogy. Yes, I feel it was like great. that was, it was an aha huge, moment. <laughs> aha moment for a lot of folks in the in the COP. Um, and I also think it's it, there's both the, the the individual topping pieces, but also then you can have a slice of the pizza, right? Which yes. might be all of the components together, but with like one classroom or one grade level. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jennifer, going back to you, you mentioned when you were presenting before that you involved parents um, in, in your pilot in order to kind of bring them in as allies, as partners in, in helping to develop students' ability to lead Strong Start in Spanish. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about how you decided to approach parent involvement with the pilot? And what did you learn from that? Uh, yes, for sure. So the first thing that we uh, did in reference to parent involvement was that we provided them a survey to pretty much garner some of their thoughts and feelings around what their children were coming home and sharing with them around the strong start and how it made them feel. Then I think the second, I know the second thing that we did is we brought them all together just so that we could kind of like see what it looked like for those families to collaborate, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're just doing a survey individually with, you know, yourself, you're just kind of thinking through your own ideas and your own thoughts and your own feelings, but then bringing them together for a luncheon also allowed us to know Know that they collaborated and there were some thoughts and feelings that they aligned around and it was just kind of good to build that community as a partnership around parents right because they that our elk population families don't solely come together by themselves often at all they're always part of our full community and our full gatherings but just bringing them together um just focused on like like mind was something that we um felt as though was very important just so that they could share their thoughts and ideas so those were the two things that we did do we did do um, a focus around the survey and then we brought the families together in those surveys and in that time that they spent together, they we did also ask what else do they need for a community to feel connected, loved, and prepared. Um, because just like their children, we wanted to ensure that we were meeting the needs of the community in that way too, and the families and the parents. And they brought up some really good points around things that would support them in feeling more connected and prepared. And one thing that was lifted was communications, right? We send communication communications home, but every time we do send communications home, are all the communications um, translated? So that was a big pivotal piece at that point in time to know that, yes, the information that you're receiving is something that you can kind of read through and understand and feel as connected as prepared um, to what might be coming up at your scholar school. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Alicia, would love to pass it to you. Um, I feel like having you, you and your team as part of the um, community of practice and leading that work provided such an interesting perspective since you obviously at Transcend are doing similar work with schools across the country. So you bring a different lens and a different perspective. Um, and it definitely sounded like um, from our work in analyzing the, the work of the pilots, there were some common challenges. Um, across the, the schools, some co common school-based mental health focused challenges across the schools participating in the pilot. Um, in your work that you do across the country, how does that resonate like with the trends that you're seeing? Um, and what do you see that schools are doing about it? Yeah, uh, so I think that the, the trends we're seeing across the country are really similar to the ones that we saw in DC, um, trying to address a student sense of belonging uh, is a really important trend that we see. Um, and then I think there's a newer, maybe not newer, like we didn't know this before, but newer, like there's a um, renewed focus on adults and uh, what they need to feel whole and ready to come to work and um, ready to uh, give it their best. Um, and oftentimes we're seeing that leaders are coming to these uh, coming to these problems of practice when uh, like um, 
a big problem is arising. So uh, like they're seeing an increase in referrals or they're seeing a decrease in retention or they're seeing um, fights in the in the uh, schoolyard. Uh, and then it's sort of like, okay, what are we gonna do about this? Um, at that, what, what we're hoping um, will happen over time is that schools have this, the moment to pause and say, um, how can we break down this problem that we're seeing into all of the pieces um, that might be uh, coming together to cause the problem? And, and let's try to address one of these pieces at a time. Um, let's let's uh, pilot something new in each of these areas or one of these areas at a time so that we can address this bigger issue. Um, and, and I think sometimes with the, with the speed with which school happens, you're like, okay, like teachers are unhappy. We're giving them a half day. <laughs> and it's like, that does work for that half day. Um, but if we could sit and say, okay, what are some of the reasons that we think that this might be true? And then um, if we break all of those down, how can we test something new in one of these areas and see what the data is and then use that data in, to inform our practice? Um, it's just powerful work and I think has long lasting effects, um, both in that area, but in areas across the building. Great. Thank you, Alicia. Um, for another question, Raymond, I'm going to put you on the spot for a moment and, um, invite you since I realized, I think Keely, you were able to share a bit more about, about the work that you all did for full child lunch. Um, Raymond, I feel like one thing that we've, we've heard, and I think we learned from a lot of the pilots is this really strong connection between student well-being and staff well-being and the importance of addressing adult mental health in service of student well-being and student mental health. So we'd just love to give you a chance to just share a little bit more about like specifically what was the work that TMA chose to, to take on as part of this pilot? Like what were, what were the partnerships that you all pursued? Um, and, and why did you, I guess, take that approach and kind of how do you see that intersection between adult and student mental health working at TMA? Yeah. So there's two things that we looked at that kind of pointed us in the direction. One, we were using the uh, kind of T NTP insight data. Um, and in the comments um, for the last three, four years, um, our team was saying that like, they would say, I need more support. And then we would talk to them about the coaching they're receiving or like the resources they have, or like, you know, uh, we, we'll buy whatever supplies that they need. We would still get, I need some more support. <laughs> support. And so it was only after the um, clinicians that we had who were, who were dedicated to our students would say like, Hey, I just saw five teachers this week. Um, is there anything that we could do? And then another clinician said, I saw another four teachers that we started to put together. When they are saying support, they're not necessarily saying anything that we're providing in the building that is like academic or coaching based. They're actually saying like, as a person, um, I need this. And so I think very similar to what the elementary said earlier about like how we approach um, the humanness of the children, like giving high fives that they come into the building. Also recognizing that like, as a human, like people just need a place to like process what's going on in their lives and referring them to the EAP program or having them go through our assurance to schedule counseling can be months upon months on end. And so when we were able to talk with the Y Center um, about providing this, and this actually I, I borrowed from a um, statesman who was doing this as part of their program, I'm on their board. I was like, oh, well, can you all do that for us too? And then that opened up the doors. And what was really interesting is that even though we provided the service for the first two months, no one signed up. So we have this day dedicated for people to um, sign up and no one signed up. And so the the cohort will come back and say, Raymond, I need you to like continuously talk about this and bring this closer to you. So people can say that like Raymond is really behind us. He's dedicating this. And then that opened up more and more doors to the point where we were overflowing with adults on this one day, <laughs> day providing services. Um, so it's, it's this combination of being able to use the data um, that is like in our surveys, but then use like the informal anecdotal data that our team was saying they were receiving and then translating a little bit about like what the support mean. I don't think we saw honestly anything. We just opened up another door for people to be taken care of. Um, but that one door, then we just do have a hypothesis that like happier people or people who are just more aware of how they're doing within themselves are just more likely to provide great access to education for children. And so that's that seems to be working right now. Great, thank you. 
Um, I'd love to open that question up a bit more broadly, because I think this is something we talked about a lot in the community practice. So Alicia, Keely, Jennifer, if any of you would like to can build on this idea of the adult student well-being connection and how you're seeing the importance of that. And I think that rang true, I feel like, even in pilots that were maybe more on the face of it, more student focused. I think one thing that we do find is with any pilot or shift or um, support that adults have to provide scholars, there is that level of like mindset that leaders do look at to determine who can kind of like get behind this work and support this work and just engage in the work with a level of just, you know, um, consistency, but also a level of reflection at the same time. So I do, you know, agree with the sentiments around um, the level of like staff will being, being very important as we support students in this work. Um, I know even at Bunker Hill, as we thought about um, next year moving forward, that was something that we focused on at the beginning of the year and then tried to implement ways throughout the year, but just this level of intent intentionality around what does it look like for staff well-being and how can we create time and space very similarly to how we create time and space for students um, in a day for teachers to kind of just like reset or just have that time to just reflect and identify what we're really here for, which is truly for the students, but just being able to kind of like pour into themselves for a couple minutes here and there so that they are showing them best, showing their best selves for the scholars. So yes, for sure. Yeah, and I'd add, I think um, one solution we've seen some schools use across the country is um, they're, they'll do an audit of their core values um, and find that some of those core values they're doing really, um, they're doing a really good job of using or um, creating experiences for kids that relate to those core values. So if you think about like love, um, and so, you know, kids are getting hugs when they walk, uh, they walk in the door, but then they're also, um, getting feedback that like shows that the, uh, their adult loves them and wants the best for them. Uh, but then schools are finding, okay, so I've done these, I've, I've done a good job of making sure that these core values live true for our students, but we haven't done the same for our adults. And so, um, we are, we're, we're, um, showing our kids love, but we might not be using those same skills with our adults. Uh, and so then there becomes a bit of a mismatch. Um, it's like, if we say that we mean this thing, then we have to mean it across the building, which can lead to um, a decreased sense of belonging for adults when they're like, we see you do it in one space, but we you don't do it with us. Um, and so I've seen schools say, okay, like how can we reevaluate our core values and how we're using them, not just with students, but also with our adults. Um, what are the activities look like? What are the practices look like that make it clear to our adults that we um, we believe in these core values for them as much as we do for our students? And building off that a little bit, because I really resonated a lot with what you were saying, because when we really kind of started to think about what it is that we wanted to achieve, and again, we always say we want our students to feel safe, beloved, connected, like that's our thing, but, you know, in turn, we want like our whole community to feel like that. And when we were thinking about our pilot with the whole child lunch, we were thinking about, you know, students need a break. They need this reset moment where they have this autonomy. They can just, you know, sit with their friends. Like it's not a structure, but then we were kind of like, wait, like our teachers need that as well. <laughs> like, and then they'll be able to better, you know, they're able to pour it to themselves. They're better able to pour out into our students. So that's when we start to think about like, you know, we kind of called it adult centering. And we thought about like our, staff lounges, which a lot of times weren't being uh, utilized as much as they, you know, could have been used. We have our teachers working through lunch and really kind of being like, we want you to rest and like take care of yourself. And we actually just kind of like put, you know, some of our resources into developing a, a space that actually, you know, was conducive to be able to do that. So like, you know, almost like a safe space for teachers. Um, you know, making sure we have comfortable furniture, making, we have, you know, like just giving them the different tools that they need to be able to regulate and take a break and encouraging that as school leaders as well. Great, thank you all. Um, I think we've definitely uh, learned, I think from this whole session so far that um, the quantitative data, the panorama data, insight data, 
can be really helpful, right? Um, and having those like hard numbers to grapple with can be really informative in thinking about pilot design. Another thing we spoke about though in the community of practice and throughout this past year with the pilot schools is the importance of that qualitative data and other types of you know, anecdotal data um, that, that can really inform um, a school team's planning work around a school-based mental health program. Um, and so I'd just love to open this up to anyone who'd like to share, like any, any other qualitative data that, that was important to you or your school teams in thinking about um, whether or not your pilots were working or how you wanted to inform your pilot design. Um, and, and how did you couple that maybe with any quantitative data such as panorama to, to inform your work? I think, and I mentioned this before, and I, I don't want to like beat a dead horse, but I feel like surveys always give like a depictor of how folks feel, right? Like it's not specifically like I'm counting a number or this percentage, it's me pouring into or students pouring into or families pouring into exactly how did this experience feel for you? Um, I think there's also, and I don't want to say that it's kind of like a lost art, but I think there's also this level of like just observing how students are showing up in class, right? There's this level of confidence. I'm coming in, I'm unpacking my locker quickly because I know that I am owning something that's like impacting my classroom. And I really want to make sure that I'm at that door to greet my, you know, my peers um, in my native language. And I'm really excited about making sure that like during our lunch bunch, I'm going to the Spanish teacher and preparing for our town hall and like doing our dry run and not, you know, feeling bad about the fact that I might not be going to lunch or recess because I'm owning and I'm embracing this like platform that's been provided for me to feel more connected and prepared. I think what we've also noticed um, was that there was this level of our um, English language learners feeling very connected to those teachers that worked with them 100% on content. So I'm really connected to my L teacher who pulls me for support. And I'm really connected maybe to my Spanish teacher who, you know, speaks the same language as I do. And we have this one special once a week. But what we did find was this level of connectedness to the classroom teachers and other teachers throughout the school because they had built this level of connectedness. So more engagement or more talking or more asking of even questions in class because they kind of felt safer in that space. So I would say surveys, but there's just some level of like observational data of how kids show up and the smiles and the joy that they bring to a space that I think is, you know, No, just Jennifer, I think we lost you for the last the last sentence. Could you restate your last sentence for us? Oh, you're there on mute. You yes. So I think that the last sentence that I brought up was that there's this level of just observational data with the smiles and the connectedness that isn't always tied to like a percentage, but it's just something that you see and how students show up with just a level of like more confidence and happiness and connectedness just from the experience that they've been able to be part of. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it over now to um, Rashida, my colleague. Um, thank you to our four panelists, but please don't go anywhere. And we're going to invite Melissa to um, turn her camera on as well um, so that she can uh, answer some questions for us too. We we'll just generally encourage everyone who's attending to drop any questions you have, whether they're about the Bellwether student speaks students speak report that we heard um, about earlier, or of the panel um, of our four uh, pilot schools, or Alicia from Transcend, um, to please drop any questions in the Q and A, and um, Rashida will start uh, sharing those. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, so the first question I see in our Q and A, um, I believe Melissa, this question is for you. And it asks, is there any effort, whether through this year's survey or in anticipation of future surveys, to understand what connection there is between student well-being across any of the three domains to learning outcomes? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I think the short answer is that there's not been a study planned right now specifically to examine that in, in real time in the schools, although I think it'd be really interesting. I think a longer answer is um, 
in the report, we do, as we discuss the findings, we do um, connect it to a, a lot of the research that is already out there about how some of these elements of well-being are connected to, to learner outcomes. So we're sort of drawing on an evidence base that connects those two. Um, and if I think partly probably what this person is asking is also like in these DC schools, can we track how things are related to outcomes? I think the efforts that, um, you know, F4DC is doing with the, the PLC is one way of getting at that by sort of looking at schools that are achieving good outcomes and understanding what are they doing um, in terms of SEL to support those good outcomes is sort of coming at it from a, from a like backwards mapping from what the outcomes are, that are being achieved to see um, what the sort of bright spots are. So that is one, uh, I think that is um, a way of getting at that question. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd love to do some kind of study like that in the future. It just would require um, a lot of technical setup to really design a study that could draw some causal um, inferences about what schools might be doing with SEL to the learner outcomes is a is sort of a, a bigger lift of study. Um, but there are lots of ways. So I guess what I'm saying is there are lots of ways to sort of get at that understanding um, it, without the more formal study. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Melissa, for that. Uh, somebody also dropped in the Q&A, and I can drop it in the chat, um, that a New Schools Venture Fund had published an article connecting belonging and school culture to learning um, for additional months of learning a year. So we can drop that in just as another resource. Mm -hmm. um, another question is asking, uh, it says, Raymond mentioned learning from statesmen regarding providing mental health supports for teachers. Are there other schools in the district that you all look to as exemplary um, examples of using well-being data to inform supports? Can't speak to the data, uh, but I do know of other schools who are doing a similar program in the district um, through various vendors. So I, I do know that there's a group of folks who are trying this out, um, but I can't speak to like what's his employer, what's not his employer. I think we're in the early stages of this right now. Thanks, Raymond. Anyone else have any schools that, um, schools that were on the radar for doing any particular work that um, you think is noteworthy to mention? All right, um, another question. Um, and this could be answered by the pilot schools or Alicia, how would you recommend schools choose the right size of practice to pilot? I can jump in. Um, the short answer is pick a small one. Uh, the longer answer is uh, oftentimes things, things that you want to pilot are related to something that you're looking to learn. So there's, uh, I want to learn something about uh, my students who are struggling in, uh, in at lunchtime. And so in order to learn something new, uh, you need to sort of shrink your, uh, shrink the variables. And so the smaller you get, the more you can learn about the specific thing that you've chosen. And then you can add on that learning by doing other small tests. Uh, and so short answer again, start small. Great, thanks. Um, and then let's see, I believe we have time for uh, one more. And um, actually, this isn't a question. It's just a note. Uh, thank you, Mike Lamb, um, who's in the in the one of these invisible bubble in the audience, um, named that in DCPS, we tri triangulated belonging and learning outcomes and found there were no schools who had low relationships and belonging 
and more than 20% proficiency on park. So really appreciate you naming that, that there is that, um, there is that data that connects the belonging with um, academic outcomes. So super helpful. I'll just, Rashida, I can just note also, mm -hmm. so you mentioned the New Schools Venture Fund work. I know at Bellwether, we're actually working with New Schools Venture Fund. We've done a qualitative study of, of some of their schools looking at what schools around the country are doing to support an expanded definition of student success, which includes whole child and academics. And um, they're coupling that with some of their quantitative data to look into some of those correlations as well. So that'll be coming out in the summer too. And that includes a bunch, um, some of the DC based public schools who took this survey as well. Awesome, yeah. very helpful, thank you. All right, um, switching gears, I'd now like to introduce Elizabeth Ross, Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, who will share more about Aussie's continued work with school-based mental health. So much Rashida and team, and I'm trying to come off video, but it looks like I am still blocked, although I am here and hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ross. I lead our division of teaching and learning at Aussie. Thanks, that should do it. Hi guys, Elizabeth Ross. Um, I am really delighted to be here today. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and new faces, and I have just loved this conversation. It's happening at a really uh, opportune time for our jurisdiction. As many on this call know, we are in the final stages of um, a publishing SEL standards, social emotional learning standards for the city of DC. We have many DC LEAs, uh, uh, some of whom we had the pleasure of hearing from today, who are doing great work in social emotional learning. And so we are quite excited to leverage that expertise at the state educational agency level and have prepared a draft set of standards that our state board has a resolution of support on which they'll be voting uh, this evening. So certainly tune into our state board meeting if you're curious as, as to how that vote goes. Simultaneously, we are working in conjunction with some of the folks on this call and others throughout the city in operationalizing our first citywide school climate survey instrument. Again, this is a tool that builds on some of the great work already underway at our DC LEAs. We have many DC LEAs that are already using a school clim climate survey. We are excited to bring that tool citywide. This spring, we are working with 16 DC LEAs uh, representing most of our students in, in, in the city, and uh, those LEAs are piloting the survey instrument for us as part of an advisory cohort. We will then bring that survey instrument to scale and do its census next year, so we are very excited to be able to learn from the 16 LEAs with whom we're working now, and as part of that work with our advisory cohort, we are launching a grant opportunity with the support of Ed Forward to provide micro-grants to those LEAs to help them implement implement the survey instrument, learn from the survey instrument, and then enable us to bring those learnings citywide. So it's an incredibly exciting time where on our end, our team is excited to be able to move from um, a bright spots that we're able to highlight like we were able to do on this call here in order to truly set a floor for our students so that we know every single school in our city has the resources and supports that it needs to make sure that our students have access to sustained high quality quality, social emotional learning, and there's a tool to measure what that school climate looks like so that um, a, on our end at Aussie and at a district level, we are empowering our system leaders to act with urgency and act on good data when we are figuring out how and where to target our interventions and supports. I'm very happy to answer any questions that anyone has about these forthcoming um, initiatives coming down the pike and just again cannot thank enough so many of the people on this call who have been instrumental in helping us get these initiatives to the finish line, which um, as they say during commencement, it's of course commencement season in the spring, it really is a commencement. I mean, the, the, the uh, work of doing standards, the work of launching a school climate survey 
instrument is necessary but not sufficient. What all of this work is designed to do is actually change a child's experience in the classroom. And we are very proud that we're in a jurisdiction that is so hungry for this work to happen right now. We continue to hear from national experts that DC is unique in moving forward with social and emotional learning, with thinking about school climate, in such a um, in such a uh, high profile way in uh, during a time period when so many states are backing away from doubling down on these important competencies. So thank you again for the chance to provide a little bit more about the work that we're leading in this space. Thanks so much, Elizabeth, for being here and, and for speaking a bit about Aussie's commitment to this work. Um, we at Ed Forward are also so excited about the expansion of um, this well-being tool and the uh, you know just the expansion of, of schools using um, this data to inform their, their school-based mental health programs. So thank you. Um, and for our final speaker this afternoon, um, we thought it was really important to elevate a student perspective on well-being in schools and school-based mental health. Um, and so I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker, who is Nico Dijon, who is a ninth grader at Phelps Ace High School. Um, hi, Nico. We first uh, heard Nico's speech as part of Mikva Challenges Project Soapbox, and he has been preparing this speech that you're about to hear with the support of his teachers, Dr. Hall and Mr. Strickland. So shout out to them. Um, Nico, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nico Dijon from Phelps East High School, and I'll be speaking to you about mental health among teens and young adults. Loneliness, depression, and even the feeling of giving up are emotions people can experience. The pain of seeing everything go wrong, even though you're trying your best. Poor mental health can arise from stress, being overweight, having no purpose, doing drugs, hearing bad news, being guilty of something, and crime. Unfortunately, this may lead to suicide, dying from crime, or drug overdose. According to Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, within two years of losing access to healthcare, those with a history of mental illness are more likely to be incarcerated. According to commonwealthfund.org, in 2021, nearly 50% of people ages 18 to 25 report having a mental health condition a substance use disorder, or both. Despite having the highest rate of these conditions, people ages 18 to 25 had the lowest rate of treatment compared to adults in other age groups. As stated by recovery.org, while many people turn to drugs and alcohol to relieve stress, addictions create more stress in the long run by causing financial, legal, social, and work-related problems. In the US, 38% of the 20 million adults with substance abuse disorders have been diagnosed with a mental health condition, a situation known as dual diagnosis. Meanwhile, 18% of the 42 million adults with mental health conditions abuse substances. Mental health doesn't matter. There are people who think that way. It's a sprout, just like when you use water, sunlight, seeds, and air. Poor mental health, poor mental health is the same way. Giving your mental health neglect drugs, stress, and isolation, it will grow, but in a negative way. I'm certain because your mental health is how you see the world. The solution is to check in with people more, even if you believe they're fine. There should be areas where struggling individuals can interact and can give them hope and purpose for their life. This group needs more resources to make an honest living without doing crime, doing alcohol, and drugs. There is still hope for us, even if we are at rock bottom giving struggling individuals hope. In particular, it relates to me because I saw myself and many people struggle with mental health and make fun of themselves or taking no mind to it, and then getting affected and wishing we did more. We were losing days, weeks, months, and years of our lives. Instead of getting angry, sad, or even depressed and in a rut, I got back to work and gave myself hope. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, um, and we so appreciate you taking the time um, out of your day to be here with us and um, speak those important words about the urgency and the importance of this topic. So thank you. 
Um, and I want to say thank you again to um, Melissa, Jennifer, the rest of our panelists, um, and Nico, Elizabeth, um, all for being here um, and, and sharing your time with us this afternoon. And thank you also to all of our uh, attendees um, who brought your questions. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue to share any thoughts or feedback um, on either Bellwether's report on student well-being or our white paper. Um, I'm going to drop the link for both of those again in the chat. Um, and we encourage you to um, please read, share them with your networks. Um, and, and we would love to, to continue the conversation with you all. Um, so please share any feedback or thoughts as you uh, look at the white paper um, over the next coming days. Um, so with that, um, we're going to, to close out and um, hope everyone enjoys the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much.